Welcome, everyone, to uh, another uh, edition of the Humanities Forum here at Providence College. What do you have to say to me? Um, as some of you know, the Humanities Forum is part of the Humanities Program here at Providence College has a special relationship to the development of Western Civilization Program. And its goal really is to bring uh, students and faculty together with uh, outside speakers who bring something different to the college, something that, uh, um, that only they can offer. And so today, we have Kurt Lieberman, who is currently the, the CEO of Magni Global Asset Management. Um, Mr. Lieberman was telling me that its focus is building portfolios um, of companies that emphasize governance and on the, on the idea of governance, which I think he's going to talk to us today about. He's, um, he started a number of companies uh, he's sort of a, 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 an entrepreneur of starting companies and such. Um, his background, he has a BS in engineering at the beautifully named Harvey Mudd. Is it called college? College, yeah. Harvey, uh, Harvey, is it a Harvey Mudd College? Or? Harvey Mudd College, yep. I love that name. <laughs> uh, an MBA from the University of Chicago. Um, and he's going to speak to us today on sustainability requires good governance. So let's give him a welcome. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you, Jim. Sure. Thank you, everyone, for bringing me back. I was here about 18 months ago and spoke, and apparently I did well enough to uh, get invited back. So I'm happy to be back. Um, I believe we have at least one swimmer. You've got to leave early. Two swimmers. What do you swim? Distance. Distance. Breaststroke. So distance, mid-distance, long distance? A little bit of both. My son, my, both my kids were swimmers, so I get it. I understand you may have to leave. Uh, swimming is a great sport. Uh, by the way, my daughter, after quitting swimming, started doing triathlons. Swimmers are positioned to do triathlons because the swimming intimidates the non-swimmers, that leg of the triathlon. Uh, my daughter has also become a very has also become a very strong biker, which is important for triathlons. Um, sorry to hear about your loss in hockey last night. I'm not a UMD fan, um, not that I'm against it, but I'm from Minnesota. So like Rhode Island, like Massachusetts, we care a lot about hockey as well. Now I have a trivia question and Patrick and Jim can't answer this because they know the answer to this question. Today, is one of the great sporting events in our country that very few people have heard of. Anyone want to guess what it is? No. For those of you that are closer to my age, you may have seen a movie called Breaking Away. It came out in the 70s. It's a real race. And I'm glad to be here. When I scheduled this, I didn't realize that race, which occurs today, it's a real race, starts in about 50 minutes, and so I'm going to miss it, unfortunately. It's a really bicycle race. And if you Google it, Little 500, you'll see all sorts of uh, cool videos. So if you like biking, I encourage you to look at it. And if I can brag for a bit, pull up the 2015 race, you'll see my daughter winning it. So, sorry, I get my bragging moment. So, um, let's talk a little bit about governance. Um, I think it's an interesting, Providence is an interesting place to have this discussion. We were talking, Jim and Pat and Pam and I were talking before, earlier this afternoon. This school is one of the few schools that still teaches Western civilization. I think that's a wonderful thing. I think a strong foundation is really important. College should be about preparing one for life as opposed to learning specific things because the world changes. The world that we know today is not going to be the world of tomorrow. It'll be different. When I was in college, we didn't obviously have any of those laptops. 
I use something you've probably never seen called a slide rule. Back before you had even calculators, you had these little wooden things you could slide to do calculations. The world that you'll live in in the future is going to be fundamentally different. There are things that are durable. Western civilization is durable. I would submit to you governance is durable. That which is well governed will last longer and do better. I have a company based on that theory. We've been around for over a decade. So I'm going to talk a little bit about it. At any point, please feel free to ask questions. I'll also, I'm leaving time at the end for uh, questions as well. I'm going to begin in a kind of a non sequitur way if I can. The world has a lot of scandals right now. They come in all sorts of flavors. Lately there was a college admission scandal. People are going to jail over that. The Olympic gymnastics scandal with the doctor from Michigan State. The Catholic scandal. FIFA is the soccer organization taking bribes. 1MDB is in Malaysia. Some Middle Eastern folks gave a billion dollars for economic development in Malaysia. It disappeared and magically the nephew of the Prime Minister at the time ended up with $700 million in a bank account that no one knows how it got there. There are many, many more. I just listed a couple of them I tried to take from a variety of places. What is common about all of those scandals? What unifies all of those scandals? I would submit governance or lack of governance. In every case, you're dealing with situations where organizations had profound organizational flaws that allowed not only the scandal to start, but even worse, to fester. Because once it gets started, it's tough to bring to the light because that's not how the organization operates. Opaqueness is the foundation of bad governance. That which cannot be seen is where things happen. Think of it like mold. Mold grows in dark, warm places. If you want to prevent mold, have lots of sunlight. Good governance, transparency, is that sunlight. The reason why it's true is because perpetrators don't want their actions seen. They want to do it where it's hidden. Opaque governance provides those dark corners. Governance is the sunlight. You get two things when you get good governance. Not only are you less likely to have corruption in scandals, but on top of that, if one occurs, because we're all human, we're all mortal, we all make mistakes, they're more easily discovered. They come to light and they can get corrected. And that's why I believe that organizations, not just businesses, countries, nonprofits, churches, everything is better with good governance and that good governance should be based on transparency. So trying to be hip, which my kids who are a little older than you would tell me that'll never happen. Uh, but I, I took a picture of Megan Trainer. You know, she had that song a couple years ago about all about, about the base. It's all about the G. G is in governance. Governance is profoundly important. I'm going to talk a little bit about how it impacts things, but I'm also going to talk a little bit about how to measure it because you can measure something as abstract and as amorphous as governance, and you can actually quantify it. That's what we do. From a financial perspective, for those of you interested in investing, governance drives performance. That's just not me saying that. That list of organizations is just a subset. These are probably the most famous uh, organizations or journals to publish academic papers about the power of governance and performance. And if you distill them all down, they come up with three things. So this is for the subset of you that um, want to go into the investing world or the business world. There are three best practices. 
Number one is look for strong governance. It's more important than environmental and social considerations, no matter how important they are to humanity. From an investment performance standpoint, look at governance. Next is um, in the world of finance, which is the world I live in, there's basically two ways to consider things. There's what's called a positive way and a negative way. So, for example, uh, the USCCB, the US Council uh, of Catholic Bishops, published investment guidelines, and they said, uh, Catholic investing, if you want to abide by Catholic rules, you cannot invest in any company that produces any sort of abortion-inducing drug. So you remove those. Those are not eligible for investing. That's called negative screening, removing. Positive screening would say, this company better upholds Catholic values than that company, so I'm going to put more of the company that does a better job upholding the values into my portfolio. Positive screening has more impact on performance than negative screening. And the third is, if you're actually going to be investing, stay current. See what's happening. If a company might improve, it might deteriorate over time, and reward or penalize a company for that. That's what we do in my company. I'm going to, um, take, I'm going to continue along the business theme for a moment. Uh, this is a spreadsheet of uh, financials for General Electric. If you go into the business world or the investing world, there's lots of this that's built. People spend hours and hours and hours building these very complicated spreadsheets. At Goldman Sachs, it's kind of a, a way that they vet their, their employees, that they can survive the 20 hours a day of working in spreadsheets. They can then make a lot of money. Out of that, people forecast the future earnings of a company, and they say that future earnings should explain what price should be received for that stock, right? Because that's the basis. A company that's tr a traded company on a stock exchange has a share price, and that share price represents the present value, the current value of that future earnings stream. We in America, forgive me, but we're naive. We're really naive here. We're such a big country that we think that the rest of the world works like us. The rest of the world doesn't work the same way. And so here, it's taken some tries, but we've actually got a pretty good system so that if you look at financial statements, they're accurate. And if you make projections, they might have some meaning. That is not true everywhere in the world. Countries differ. They work very differently. They have a different legal system, a different regulatory system, a different court system or adjudicative system, different economic infrastructures, different cultural factors that change the way things work and the way governance works around the world. That has some pretty profound implications. For example, well, let me, one other thing, let me talk a little bit about it. The accounting system. The accounting system is how you record the numbers, the financial numbers, that explain how a company is working. The rules are different around the world. The legal systems are very, very different. What's protected, how it's protected, where you have rights, where you don't have rights. Is the court system honest? Can you get a fair hearing? Can you get a fair hearing in Venezuela if you've got a case? I would submit not. The economic system, how does the government regulate economic activity? Those all have impact. When you look at governance from an economic perspective, there are very social perspectives. I'm going to think about it from an economic perspective. Ask yourself three basic questions. Can you believe what you see in numbers? Do the financial statements make sense or not? And are they reliable? Second of all, are your rights protected? Not just your rights as an individual, we've got the First Amendment, we've got the Bill of Rights, all that sort of stuff. There's a layer of property rights. If you come up with an idea, can you profit from that idea or some, can someone steal it? If you own a share in something and that company gets in trouble, what happens? Last uh, end of, just after Thanksgiving, I was in Bahrain, which is in the Gulf. It's an island, but it's attached by a bridge from Saudi Arabia, and I had dinner with a Saudi prince. And uh, 
we were talking because Saudi Arabia is going to become an investable country next month. And he wanted to know what I thought of Saudi governance. I was, <laughs> my wife thought I was crazy for going for this, to this dinner, <laughs> given what happened to Khashoggi. I said, no, I'm not going to get murdered. I'm not going to the consulate. So, um, but it did help. We were in Bahrain. And um, his assistant was there. By the way, um, in my travels, I meet a lot of Saudis. About half the Saudis I meet have this edge to them, this kind of, they throw these little barbed questions at you and they're just tr trying to embarrass you. And the Saudi prince's aide was doing that the whole time. And so I was a little nervous. And I said, you realize that something that seems quite normal in Saudi Arabia, which is they have no corporate governance law. So if you have a business in Saudi Arabia, let's say um, you have a joint venture there, and it gets in trouble, financial trouble, for whatever reason. And now there has to be some process, you know, like we have bankruptcy process. There has to be some process around it. There's no law that defines that. The reason why, for, if you've heard the terms Chapter 7, Chapter 11, those are sections of the U.S. law that explains how things go on. There's no equivalent like that in Saudi Arabia. So you have this joint venture. It gets in trouble. What happens? It goes to the Saudi family. The Saudi family consults Sharia scholars. The Sharia scholars then issue a fatwa, and the fatwa determines what the Saudi rulers should do, which can be gerrymandered a little bit. And so I'm sitting at dinner, and I'm saying, you know what? If someone's a Muslim in Saudi Arabia, they may understand this. You take a Western business person who has very little exposure to Islam, this sounds random. Now, what is that? What happens? If I'm a business person considering a project in Saudi Arabia, and I could do it there, or I could do it someplace else, I better have better prospects in Saudi Arabia to offset the higher risk associated with this lack of property rights. Now, are you familiar with the term MBS, the current leader of the crown prince in Saudi Arabia? He's a young guy. He's made a lot of mistakes. He has this big vision. Um, he has something called Vision 2030. He wants to remake the kingdom and uh, make it open and make it less dependent on oil. He's trying to build a Disneyland. I don't, I don't think it's going to work, but he's trying, to, he's trying to build an Islamic version of Disneyland uh, on the Red Sea. He's trying to diversify away from oil. My point to the Saudi prince was, if you don't do the things that make your country attractive to foreign investment, it means all of the money to do Vision 2030 will have to come from the kingdom itself. They'll be less likely to be successful. At that point, uh, that uh, the aide switched from throwing barbs at me to he was now my best buddy, which was funny. But um, it's how governance has rather profound implications on the way things operate and the way things exist and the way things will uh, happen going forward. The last uh, big question is a bit of an abstract question, but it's a very important one. To what extent can a company make decisions confidently without the interference of a corrupt government? If you're in Venezuela, you can make very few decisions without considering what the government's going to do. It impacts your daily life. That will in turn uh, impact how that company operates and all of the companies that operate. And collectively, that will mean a, the companies will not be as successful, the economy will not be as successful, the employment will not be as high, the financial success of the country will be lower. It just ripples on. In China, there are financial statements. I just pulled. I, I assume these are real companies. People spend time analyzing these financial statements. I would submit to you that that has very, very little to do with the valuation of companies in China because their financial system stinks. The accounting system stinks. I had a friend who tried to buy into a Chinese company, and um, there's something called a balance sheet, which says basically what assets and liabilities you have. And he was looking at it, and he said, okay, you claim to have um, several million on the balance sheet in cash. Can, I, can you prove that? Well, it turns out the cash is not cash over there. 
if, if these things are not accurate, why do you spend time analyzing them? This is a company, um, just a made-up company, but take a look at the, uh, it's had some troubles, you can see by all the losses. You could spend time looking at that, but if the country, company happens to be in the country of Turkey with Erdogan, who since the attempted coup about, was it, about four years ago, has become an autocrat and a tyrant, I think it's a lot more important to understand what's happening in Turkey than to understand the financials of that company. Now, to, to be fair to Erdogan, Erdogan, prior to the attempted coup, made a lot of improvements in Turkey, and he got an unfair rap in the U.S. press. He did a lot of good things. But when someone tries to shoot you and take over the government with a coup, you react. I think he's way overreacted, but that's easy for me to say standing right here as opposed to being over in Turkey. How about Russia? You're looking at an investment in Russia. Which would you rather have? Would you rather have the financial statements about the company in Russia, or would you rather know the personal relationship of the CEO to Putin? I'd rather know the relationship. It tells you a heck of a lot more. It's amazing how Putin's friends get rich and Putin's enemies die. It's a reality. So how many people have seen the movie The Graduate? It really dates me. Yeah, the, the professors. Um, it's actually a very good movie. This is a scene from the movie The Graduate. And in it, the fellow on, as you look at it, the right is telling Dustin Hoffman's character, who's a new graduate from college, about how he has one word for him, and the word is plastics. I'd have the one word is corruption. Corruption is what this is all about. Things that are corrupt don't work as well. Not just financially. I know I'm very, I've been very financially focused where we're dealing with almost every scandal deals with corruption at some level. So this impacts environmental, it affects social, it affects everything. Uh oh, there we go. Um, huh, complicated chart. Don't try and follow it, all you're welcome to. Do you remember a couple years ago when, um, may not have, Bangladesh lost $81 million? North Koreans, uh, we're fairly sure it's the North Koreans. North Koreans stole $81 million. They attempted to do a lot more. This diagram explains all the things that they did to try and steal money. Um, fortunately, they misspelled billion in one of their requests to the U.S. Federal Reserve. Um, so it was, there was this one, and where is the other one? But they, they sent a request to move about a billion dollars, and they had misspelled billion, and so it got rejected, fortunately. But among all these requests, only two got through, and it was over here through uh, the Philippine Bank. If you'd asked my company prior to this occurring how someone could steal large amounts of money from a sovereign uh, entity, we would have told you Philippines. Very simple reason. In the Philippines, the, um, there are casinos. The Philippine casinos are trying to compete with the casinos near Hong Kong and Macau. Chinese high rollers tend to go to Macau. Philippines wants more of the high rollers to go to the Philippine casinos and bring the money there and all the hospitality. So the Philippine casino operators lobbied the government to get exceptions to all of the normal rules about how you handle vast sums of money. They're called money laundering rules, or anti-money laundering rules, or AML rules. So you, if you send more than $10,000 in cash anywhere, any financial institution in the world is supposed to understand who's at both ends of that transaction. It's called know your customer rules. Philippine casinos don't have to follow that. As a result, what happened? When they finally found someone who'd process the request, which is our good old Federal Reserve Bank in New York, which blocked 30, four orders got through, Royal, uh, the uh, Philippine bank processed them, sent them to a little service organization, split the money into three piles and sent them out to casinos where they were turned into chips and they're immediately untraceable. 
I was in Malaysia in January and had dinner with uh, uh, someone in the SWIFT network. SWIFT is an acronym that stands for the actual computer system that's used by the uh, central banks of the world to connect to each other. And I asked him, because it was the SWIFT network that was hacked to make that uh, wire transfer occur, how did that occur? And did, did they um, blackmail someone? Did they bribe someone? Did they use malicious software? He said, here's what happened. The um, Bangladesh Central Bank, to save money, bought used computers and used routers. They bought them from someone that had preloaded malicious software on that equipment. That malicious software then recorded the keystrokes so they could get passwords and IDs. And that's how they broke into the SWIFT network to send the money. The point of the chart is when you have weaknesses in your governance, and a, an exemption on AML rules is a weakness in the Philippines. It is one of the things that they're weak at, not the only thing. It creates problems, and it was a big embarrassment for the Philippines. It also was a big embarrassment for Bangladesh, and it was a big embarrassment for this country because we were a middleman. And we claim that we were innocent in it, but we didn't do our homework. Our Federal Reserve Bank didn't do its homework on such a transfer. It's not just um, emerging countries. Developed countries can have trouble as well in governance weaknesses. The UK is, is a pretty well-governed country. Matter of fact, you know, with Brexit going on, we believe the United Kingdom will eventually be okay. It's going to go through a fairly disruptive process, probably more disruptive than it needs to be, but they'll be okay. They're pretty well governed. They are not perfect. They have some of the best rules, these AML rules, they have some of the best implementation within the financial services industry. They turn a blind eye. How many people have been to London? I mean, it, did you notice how expensive real estate is? Notice the number of really high-end cars? They have Russian oligarchs, they have golf money, they have all sorts of foreign money that's flown into London. Got in there because they bypassed that whole financial services industry. The money got in there by buying artwork, by going through lawyers, by going through real estate agents, by going through buying exotic cars, and they were able to move money in skirting the system. You know, it's a big political mess over there as to how much they're going to tighten it because there's a faction that says we should turn a blind eye to that. Take a look at all the wealth that comes in. I'd submit to you that wealth that's coming in is not doing a lot for that country. Yes, you have some affluent people there. It's bidding up home prices so that a lot of others can't buy more moderate priced housing. Less market integrity. Your markets are not as reliable means more risk. That is going to hurt your country. It's going to hurt the country's performance. Emerging markets, actually, let me go back. Um, the world, there's about 300 countries in the world. The world's divided into groups of countries. We are part of what's called the developed world, right? Germany, Canada, United Kingdom, Australia, New Zealand. The countries you'd expect, Japan, are the developed world. There's 23 of them. The next slice of countries, uh, currently 24, going to 26 next month, are what are called emerging markets. Brazil, Russia, India, China, Mexico, Thailand, South Africa, Poland, Philippines, and so on. Argentina and Saudi Arabia get added next month. Emerging market countries generally have weaker governance than developed countries. That's not surprising. That's not surprising. Some of them are improving. I would say the one that has the best shot going forward is Malaysia. This is an article that was just published uh, last month in Islamic Finance News about six reforms that Malaysia needs to do to have a quality of governance consistent with the developed world. Not only, um, so earlier I mentioned the 1MDB scandal. Najib was the name of the prime minister who did the corruption. and. Uh, 11 months ago, there was, 10 or 11 months ago, there was an election and it was expected that Najib won. A guy named Mahathir won. 
Mahathir had been prime minister years ago. He came back out of retirement to knock off Najib. And he's going, paving the way for a successor named Anwar to take over next year. And Anwar is running on an anti-corruption platform. If he is successful, I could see in three to five years Malaysia being considered in the same group as like a, um, a smaller developed country, a New Zealand uh, country like that. And I think that'd be great. It'd be the first Islamic majority Muslim country to get that designation. And so it'd be a big source of pride. So uh, let's see. Uh, if you're interested, you can go to my company's website um, because every quarter we publish this trending chart. It's what's happening in the world. And it conveniently uses the stoplight colors. So a country such as Australia, green and green, it means its absolute score is improving and its relative rank is improving. In contrast, the U.S. got a small downgrade. It wasn't a big one. Um, and it's also declining in relative rank. It's not a political comment. It has nothing to do with Trump, whether you like Trump or not. It has to do with the infrastructure of our, our country. So we rank all these countries. You'll see two more rows. I've got to have my team figure out how to add two more rows on the right-hand side of the chart and reformat everything to add Saudi Arabia and Argentina. Saudi Arabia will come in about equal with Turkey in our rankings. It'll be behind uh, Indonesia and uh, Malaysia and among the Islamic countries. Uh, the Saudi prince was not happy to hear that when I told him that. And he said, in addition to the corporate governance, what else should they change? And I, and I said, opaqueness of the government. No one understands what the government spends, where it spends, how the economy is performing. So if you don't understand that, how do you build business plans to take into account the conditions that will exist in the coming year or in the coming couple years. We'll see if they change, I don't know. Measuring governance is not easy, right? It's kind of an abstract notion. I'm, assume, I'm assuming that before you came to this class session, governance was not something you thought about as, as being translated into a number. As far as I know, we're the only people who do this. There are other people who measure various little pieces, but we have a comprehensive measure of governance. It's not done because it's tough to do. There's, there aren't organizing frameworks that say, this is how you put the information together. The information itself is hard to find. And in financial services, it's qualitative information. It's not quantitative. And financial services are full of people who love numbers. That's what they do for a living. And to really do governance right, you've got to get to behavior levels. So um, at the risk of being a bit provocative, people will measure things like women on boards. I think having women on boards is a great thing and it's important. It is not, it's not true that just because you put a woman on the board that some other company is a better company. It's more socially just, it's more inclusive, there's a lot of important things. There are good and bad women you can go on a board just like they're good and bad men. You have to see how the company operates. You've got co companies where there are women on the board and they treat women in the company poorly. So you've got to get to the behavior level of how things actually work. We believe that governance is revealed by the behaviors. Now another movie, probably more for the professor group. Um, I would assume that almost everyone that's a professor here knows this movie without having seen any of the text. The movie's Casablanca. If you've never seen the movie, it is one of the great movies ever made. And that's coming from a guy who's 61. But let me tell you, my daughter who's 26, she and I made a trade when she was a teenager. Uh, Napoleon Dynamite was a brand new movie and she really wanted me to watch it. And I suffered through it, I hated it. Some, many of you may like it. I absolutely thought it was a terrible movie. And um, I said, I'll do that, but you have to watch a movie. And she, she put it off and put it off. I forced her to watch Casablanca. It took me about five years to get her to watch it. And by the end of it, I said, okay, Liz, what'd you think? She goes, oh, awesome movie. 
So even one without any special effects and you know, in black and white, it's a fabulous movie. The reason why I'm using it here is I'm going to set up the scene even though you haven't seen the movie. This takes place in World War II in, um, in a part of the world that was under control of the Vichy government. Vichy government after France is conquered by Germany. They set up a government and in North Africa uh, the French are ruling but under the, uh, the auspices of the Germans. And uh, Humphrey Bogart plays a character that runs this cafe called Rick's Cafe. In the back he has a gambling operation. Gambling's not allowed. But he still has it. And everybody knows he has it. Claude Rains pictured here as Captain Renault, is head of the local police force. And of course he allows this gambling to go on. In this particular scene, the Nazis are putting pressure on him to close down the cafe. So he steps forward, blows his whistle, his gendarmes come in and they close down the cafe. And Rick comes up to him and goes, why are you shutting down my cafe? And um, the Claude Rains goes, I'm shocked, I'm shocked, there's gambling going on. At that point, the croupier, or who's got all of the, uh, the captain's money from gambling, comes out and says, sir, here are your winnings. The point is, it doesn't matter what the rules are. If the rules aren't enforced, who cares what the rules say? It's what really happens that matters. Again, separate from this whole thing, if you've never watched Casablanca, watch it. It's a great movie. So. How do you research governance? How do you understand it? How do you look at it? Um, when it comes to countries, we rank, we use 280 factors, all qualitative, to rank a country. Um, most uh, times when people look at metrics, they're looking at structural items. If you will check the box at either a company or a country level. Uh, at a company level, because we measure company governance as well as country governance, what a lot of people do is take information out of the company produced brochures like a sustainability report. I think it's good that companies are doing it. I'm not trying to diss the idea that companies are producing those reports. They're good and interesting reports. You just have to understand their marketing pieces. If a company is bad at the environment, they're not going to go in their uh, sustainability report and say, oh, we're actually not so good at the environment. They're going to they're gonna focus on whatever it is that they're good at from the environmental perspective, but not the bad things. There are companies that do what are called ESG ratings, environmental social governance ratings. They tend to take large amounts of data and stick it in a database, and they think that the more data they have, the better they have. There's no, there's no navigation of it. There's no what's called taxonomy, a logic to structure the data and hence to provide good insights. What you need is deeper insights by understanding behavior and you need to take a look at that across the entities that are relevant. That's why we tend to use an iceberg as a metaphor for what we do. Most people look at the visible part which is the smaller part. It's the, impor the important part is what's underneath the water. Um, if you ever wanted to look at what we do, uh, we have indexes. Uh, for those of you who are not familiar with the concept of an index, an index is a number. And there's a process for calculating the number. They can't be bought. You can do things with indexes. But if you go out to our website, you can take a look at our emerging markets, M-A-G-E-M, and that's how the performance of the emerging markets are doing. EFI, the second one, is the developed countries outside of North America, so that excludes the U.S. and Canada. And then the third one is all of the investable countries of the world. Um, introduce a guy um, that you think you may know. That's not the former football player, for those of you old enough to remember, Steve Young. This is not uh, Steve Young of the 49ers. He's one of the founders, whoops, one of the founders of my company. Um, Steve is one of the founders of the corporate social responsibility movement and um, a lot of our intellectual capital comes from him and from uh, the late f uh, other founder. And he helped us on the corporate uh, side. We licensed intellectual property from his nonprofit called the Co-Roundtable. 
The Co Roundtable owns the term moral capitalism, which is the belief that capitalism can be a force for good in the world if done well. And I would submit to you that no other force in the world has produced uh, the reduction in poverty that capitalism has, but capitalism can be applied well and can be applied poorly. In the world today, um, a lot of capitalism is what we would call crony capitalism. It exists to enrich those that have power. Capitalism, when done well, is something that is a broad-based, inclusive system. So we licensed their intellectual property, we rebuilt it as an analytical model, and then we built investment portfolios off of that. It is a more holistic approach to governance because it's at the behavioral level and it looks across the stakeholder relationships. A lot of people that try and take a look at corporate governance tend to take a look at shareholders and um, uh, employees. We, yes, we look at both of those. We also look at the relationship with customers, the relationship with suppliers, the relationship with competitors, and the relationships with the communities in which they operate. In addition to, whoops, there we go. In addition to that, um, <laughs> we've bid on some, we bid on um, some work with at the Vatican, Christian Brothers International, which is the retirement fund for the nuns and priests outside the U.S. And we lost the business in the 11th hour uh, because we couldn't commit that uh, there were no companies in our portfolio that produced an abortion-inducing drug. So based on that, um, we um, worked with some experts and distilled out of Catholic social teachings, basically chapters 7 and 8, the core guidance of the Catholic religion on uh, governance. And out of that, we built... Uh, the Catholic values model. Um, we align with the aforementioned USCCB, the US Council of Catholic Bishops, which has 14 investment guidelines. Um, I don't think anyone else adheres to more than six of them. We adhere to all 14. I have never seen anyone other than us map. We actually will lay out exactly how we implement all 14 points in it. And out of that, we built portfolios um, using a Catholic value score. So we take the secular model for corporate governance and infuse it with Catholic themes about subsidiarity, universal destination of goods, solidarity, and create a Catholic version of governance. We also did that in Islam as well. This is Professor Muhammad Hashim Kamali. Um, amazing man, he, he's, he's helped uh, us a ton. Uh, we took in um, Islam, uh, most of you are familiar with the concept of Sharia. I would submit none of you understand Sharia. It's not, that's not the purpose of the discussion. I only say that because be careful. Most of what you hear is wrong on, on it. Sitting above Sharia, though, which are basically commands on how a good Muslim should live their life, is something called the Makassid. The Makassid of Sharia. It's the overarching objectives of Sharia. And if I was to list those here, there's nothing you would find objectionable. Whether you're a Catholic, whether you're a Protestant, whether you're a Muslim, a Jew, an atheist, or an agnostic. It's about being a good human being. We use the Makassid. Um, side note on um, Kamali, by the way. Um, well, I'll, I'll leave that for another time because it's. I want to leave some time for questions. Wonderful man. Uh, he helped us. We built Islamic portfolios. And so uh, GOV is our index for secular. ISLM is the Islamic. CITH is the Catholic one. You can look on our website and see them out there. Let me just wrap up. Governance is very important. It impacts things far beyond finances. I know this was more of a business financial view of it. It impacts social justice issues. It impacts environmental issues. It impacts the basic success of countries. It's not easy to measure, and most people look in the wrong place. They look at the visible part. You have to look underneath the waterline to see what the un real behaviors are underneath it. questions.
Thank you. Thank you. We're going to use the mic if that's okay. Sure. Sorry, it was. No, no, okay. So just uh, raise your hand. Yeah, we've got one right here. Good afternoon. Thank you for coming by. Uh, you, you talk about gov governance. Uh, do you have any specific examples at the corporate level? What would be like the top three factors within an organization we, we should look at sure. that are most important? And a second question related to maybe mm -hmm. I was surprised by the name of your firm. Does it have any meaning? Sure. <laughs> yes. Um, I'm not the founder of the firm. Uh, the founder. Um, wanted to use a Greek or Roman uh, mythological character because so many financial institutions do. All of the good names were taken and so we weren't going to go Bacchus or Hades or Cerberus. So uh, he um, married a Norwegian woman so they went to Viking mythology and uh, Magni is the son of Thor known for feats of great strength. So that's the history of the name. Uh, your first question. We measure 316 variables in our corporate governance model. One set of them that we consider to be one of the most important is something called board perspective, which is the extent to which the board of directors of a company truly understands what the company does. Sounds like a pretty simple thing, and clearly better understanding is more. It's pretty clear that there are a bunch of boards of directors who don't know what's happening in your, their company. And I would submit a poster child recently is General Electric. Take a look at the massive surprise write-downs in General Electric. Immelt ran that organization very opaquely, and they continue to, to get surprises at the billion-dollar level. It's not easy to measure. I think a second element is, um, it's not so much the question, but it's how you think about the question. In the ESG world, um, people believe that it's a moral imperative for companies to be involved in their communities, that somehow it's, they should f be giving money just because it's a good thing to do. We look at it in a different way, which is companies that frame it not as somehow some moral obligation, which it can be, but view it as a self-serving way of accomplishing their objectives. So they run programs to build strong relationships with the community that help the community, which make, makes it a better place to recruit talent, makes it a, uh, easier for them to, if they want to do something new, they want to build some new plant, that the community is a supporter because they've been such a good citizen, a good corporate citizen in that local area, that they want more of that company. And um, leads to an interesting discussion about is something done for self-serving reasons that's good somehow worth less than something good done for altruistic reasons. I'm not trying to get into that kind of philosophical academic argument. We make the case that if someone does something for, that's good for self-serving reasons, you have greater confidence that they're going to continue doing it because they don't have to go through that altruistic debate. Other questions? Yeah, oh, sorry. sorry. Hi. Um, thanks for coming. Oh, thank you. I did have a question. Um, my first question kind of ends up being the same. Okay. Um, the first one was, how much does a candidate make um, pay for in terms of quality and commitment? Yep. So how much does a candidate get covered for? Yep. Also, please just mention the one in MDB. One MDB, MDB yeah. Great, great questions. Um, on the first part, scandals. Um, in our view, scandals are lagging indicators. In other words, when a scandal occurs, the source of the scandal has existed for a long time before that. And I'm going to go on a quick digression if I can. In poorly run com countries, 
oftentimes a scandal is a political event, not a scandal. So when you read in the paper about a scandal in Russia, it's not because that scandal suddenly was known about. It's because whoever is accusing the other person of the scandal wants political power. You have to get below that. And so lagging, meaning whatever created the opportunity for the scandal existed here, time goes on and the scandal becomes public over here. Now, we do use scandal information. Let me use in a current, a real current situation. We have not decided what we're going to do with Boeing regarding the 737 MAX and the two plane cra crashes where all the people were killed. Because we don't understand what the root cause issue inside Boeing that allowed them to develop the 737 MAX and uh, launch it when it was so dependent on unreliable sensors. We know enough now that VW, if you go back to the diesel emission scandal, if you follow that one, that was a systemic issue. A culture had been built in that organization that diesel was the answer and they were going to make sure that diesel looked good independent of reality. And they took out the CEO. That's a good thing they did. They've got to let make a lot of other changes. I hope they do because it, it had been a good company, but there is a rot inside that company. There's a rot inside Wells Fargo. I don't know, we don't know yet how deep the rot is in Boeing, and we're trying to figure that out. In the meantime, we will give companies a demerit to decrease their score for negative things, but it's temporary. We, we measure how long it lasts and how deep it is, and then we kind of cure it, which is over time, the impact goes away, unless there's new news that says it still hasn't been there. We don't give huge demerits, though, for an individual scandal, because we're looking for the root cause, which is inevitably some sort of governance issue that takes time to ferret out. And hopefully, we've known about those governance issues. Sometimes we have. I wish we were perfect. We're not. With regard to Goldman Sachs, it's still not clear how deep the issues go. There is a cultural issue at uh, Goldman Sachs. There's also, a, I spent some time at McKinsey and Company. McKinsey ha has been involved peripherally in some scandals, and it's got its own issues. I wrote a letter back to our, I'm, I'm the one I left, I don't know, 20, almost 30 years ago. But I wrote a letter back to our managing director after he wrote a letter to all the alums saying, we're going to be better. That's not good enough. <laughs> the, um, I, d I wouldn't paint all of financial services with a broad brush. They, they vary significantly. L let me give you a small example. In, in my hometown, I live in Minnesota, there's a bank called Sunrise Bank. I, it's a model of good governance. It's too small for us to worry about putting into portfolios. There are some very good financial institutions. I think Jamie Diamond runs a very good company. And I think he's the best CEO in financial services right now. Um, Wells Fargo's not good. Goldman's got some issues. Um, I hope um, Warren Buffett's advice is followed for Wells Fargo. He's recommended that they go to the outside of the financial services industry to get their next CEO. I'd love to find someone who went into a company that was ethically challenged and cleaned it up. I don't care what industry that person was in. I hope that's the person that Wells Fargo brings in. Is that? Yeah. yeah. Yes. Um, not really, no. It's, it's about whether the root cause is addressed as opposed to how they manage the scandal. We'll look at that sort of thing. So um, in the um, Wells Fargo example, them changing compensation plans for employees is a good first step. Um, we have to see how they launch some new products and how they provide managerial incentives before we're going to say that they fixed it. Going back and saying, well, this incentive created that scandal, 
and I'm going to change that particular incentive. It's not good enough. It's a, it's a deeper issue than that. You know what I mean? Yes. Yeah, um, we'll see over the long term. Um, do, uh, do you remember in the 70s the Firestone 500? Um, there's some analogies to that. For those of you not familiar with it, um, the, um, at the time, uh, Firestone and Goodyear were the two dominant tire brands, not only in the U.S., but in a lot of other countries as well. Um, Michelin was a small French tire maker, and they came out with radial tires, which lasted a lot longer. You never hear about radial tires because all tires are radial, but they were much more reliable. They lasted a lot longer. Firestone slapped together a radial tire, brought it out as the Firestone 500. It was a mess. It was poorly designed, and it destroyed the company. I don't know where Volkswagen is going to go over the long term. And I would submit that um, even if they sold a couple additional cars, they didn't, they didn't build. Their brand was hurt by that. They've got it bad reputation. We'll see what the repurchase rate is on those vehicles. We'll see what sort of products they launch in the future. There probably are some examples where crime pays. I think generally that's not the case. Wells Fargo hasn't benefited from, from its activities. General Electric hasn't. Boeing, which is an otherwise good company, is probably going to go through a lot of years of pain for uh, what's happening there. We'll see. Yes. Great question, probably a bit of a sensitive topic, but, but happy to go there. Um, when the scandal first broke, I lived in Dayton, Ohio at the time, long before Magni, and I ran a business. My head of HR was a former Franciscan friar who left and went into HR. And we were sitting in a bar drinking, talking about business stuff, and I asked him about this, and he said, this scandal could well destroy the church because its organizational structure dates back to the Middle Ages and has not evolved over the centuries. And I remember that comment. It's over 20 years ago. And I think he's right. Um, you have a very opaque system in the actual organizational structure of the church and the way the Vatican operates. And it's fiefdoms where the bishops and the cardinals have a tremendous amount of control and relatively little accountability. And it extends beyond the sexual abuse scandal. Go to the finances. Um, Cardinal Pell, yes, he was implicated and taken down in one of the scandals. Cardinal Pell was doing a lot of good plumbing, fixing the infrastructure of the church. And there were threats on his life. He'd go to cardinals and say, Look, I'm trying to centralize the finances because the church has never centralized its finances. And so can you tell me about your operation? And the bishop or the cardinal would give a financial statement, and he'd look at it, and he'd go, clearly there's stuff missing from this. And he'd go back, and the person would say, oh, but this fund over here is for this hospital. I mean, you didn't need to know about this, or it's for this boy's whatever. So the church... I'm hoping the church comes out stronger, but it's going to be a long, slow process. And it's going to be very uncomfortable for the church to have the degree of transparency that's required to fix this quickly. Sorry to say that. I think the church has done tremendous good things, but it's getting an awful lot of very, in my view, appropriate tarnishing because it's been unable to deal with this. I have great respect for the pope. I think he really wants to do well. This is pushing him into areas that are not his training and not his skill set. 
and I hope he rises to the occasion. Time will tell. Yes. <laughs> it's, a, it's a spectacular question. Um, I didn't find, uh, I wasn't the founder of the company. I came in actually to turn it around because for a complicated set of reasons it wasn't doing what it was supposed to do. And um, before I got involved, they had tried to do that. It was back when we only had the country model. We weren't ranking companies, we were only ranking countries. And they tried to provide their services to fixed countries, and countries said they'd pay. So a country, to, not to be named, paid a chunk of money, and the company gave their recommendations, and the country said, okay, we paid you the money, we took your recommendations, now improve our score. Not that they changed anything. And so um, when I came in, one of the things we did is we cut off doing all that sort of work because we didn't want anyone to accuse us of being a hostage to a, to a country or now to a company either. So we don't do that. I'm happy to publish what those scores are, but I'm not taking a nickel because I don't, I don't want that problem. Yes. Sure. Yep. Yes. Well, it's, that's a very complex question. Let me try and pull, it's a great question. Let me pull apart the pieces if I can. In um, Islam, there's a concept called riba. And historically, its connection is very close to the Catholic and Christian concepts about usury, about excessive interest rates. It's a more unilateral concept in Islam, which is that one should not make money simply off of money. And that's what riba is. So there are um, Islamic financial products that do charge a fee. Sukuk, Majar, Har. Um, uh, so if uh, I was a Muslim and bought a house and I wanted an Islamic equivalent of a mortgage, I would get a Majar, Har, which is kind of like a rent to own. So Let's keep it simple. Um, let's say I'm buying a $100,000 house. I put $10,000 down. In a Western world, I get a $90,000 mortgage, and I pay that over, let's say, 15 years. In Islam, I'll just make up the numbers. Um, I go to my friend Jim here who runs m my local Islamic bank, and he would offer me a Mijarahar contract. And what we would do is we take the $90,000, and I would pay him the equivalent of, I don't know, $130,000 over 15 years in fixed payments, and I proportionally get ownership in my house as I make those payments. It's a share, he's sharing in my risk. Now the flip side is, if two years into the contract, I sell a house, he gets the majority of the gain or loss because he owns the majority of my house, right? So that's how it works. Now. Um, so you can do those sort of um, products. Uh, Sukuk is, is another one. It's not worth getting into the differences. Sukuk is a lot more common in big dollar contracts. That said, um, even though Muslims are not supposed to pay or, or receive interest, it's not just pay but receive, a lot of the sovereign wealth stuff goes on in Western financial terms. Um, I will leave out the swear word in a comment. Uh, I was uh, in a meeting um, at the UN in the Economic Society, 
and I went to a cocktail party afterwards, and there was a guy who's um, Swiss who has an investment firm in Monaco, and almost all of his clients are from the Gulf, mostly Saudi. And I was asking him about our Islamic products, and he said, you, you realize that my clients don't give a blank about that stuff, which I thought was interesting. Um, I don't know if he's correct, but at least his clients don't, don't seem to care. Uh, it's like uh, there's a prohibition on drinking, yet I know Muslims who drink. Kind of like uh, here, Mormons that drink. So um, it, it's a complex issue. I, I don't think financial structures are going to be the primary limit on, on Saudi Arabia. I just don't. Um, I was in the Middle East, and I'd been invited to talk to um, a set of lawyers uh, about, um, about how to change the legal system in the Gulf to make foreign investment more attractive. And I went back to these points about transparency, and they're saying these are difficult decisions. Well, if you want capital investment, make it less risky for people to bring money in and give them greater confidence that they're going to get a return and you'll get more money. This, Sorry, it's not rocket science. Making the changes may be politically difficult, may place kingdoms at risk. That's your choice, ultimately. And I think that's far more important than a particular financial structure that would be used to, to finance something. But it will take a lot of money to change Saudi Arabia. Yes? Sure, be happy to. Um, by the way, the U.S. is not our highest ranked country. Our what? If, if you rank all the countries in our rankings, U.S. is not at the top. It's relatively high. Canada, uh, Great uh, U.K., Germany, Australia, those Norway, Sweden, those tend to be at the top. The uh, U.S. has some wonderful strengths. Um, the argument becomes a binary argument because politicians want to pull it to the extreme. And I'm going to, if I can, I'm going to segue off your qu question to a slightly adjacent question. I'll come back if you don't think the, the answer is adequate. Um, if, you, if you talk to people who know me on Facebook, I'm pretty loud on Facebook. Um, and I argue with both the left and the right for what it's worth. I think the argument of more versus less government is a really specious argument. It satisfies nobody. It's designed to poison wells. There's good government and there's bad government. So the argument by the left that the financial crisis was created by deregulation, forgive me, it's wrong. I'm an engineer, so there's, there's some issues that are grayscales and they're subjective. It's factually wrong. There's bad regulation. And no matter how far you are on the left, you really don't want more bad regulation. Let me argue to the right, right? The right would say less regulation, less regulation. Yes, there's onerous regulation. Yes, it can be very destructive. But when it creates orderly, transparent markets where people can make informed decisions, it is beneficial. So we should want, whether you're left or right, we should want more good regulation, less bad regulations. It's a quality, not a quantity. I think the same thing can be true um, regarding social programs. So, you know, I'm getting close to the age for Medicare and Social Security. Um, yes, I understand the theorists that Social Security is a Ponzi scheme. Technically, it probably is. The reality is it's really popular. It's been around for the better part of a century, and it's going to be here forever. Okay, so those of you on the right, we're not, we're not going to go to private accounts. It's just not going to happen. It's not politically feasible. We have Social Security. It'll be there. Now, the people on the left, it's going broke. 2034, I believe, is the projected date. If we do nothing, 2034 comes. It's an immediate 27% decrease in benefits for everyone on Social Security. What we ought to be focused on is fixing it so that it works. Now, the reality is you're in my age group. We're, you know, we're the baby boom generations. 
And as a result, as we go through the system, there's so many of us, we're putting a lot of strain on the system. If you can find a way to make Social Security solvent for a couple more decades, it actually will write itself in about 2050, uh, 2060. I don't think you or I are going to see it. But by then, the po uh, population demographics will have shifted. I think Medicare is a much more difficult issue because healthcare costs are exploding. So I don't know if I answered your question. Yeah, I'm happy to pursue it further, but um, because it's, it, I get something very loud. You're all welcome to friend, friend me on Facebook and, and see my rants. My wife wishes I wouldn't. <laughs> Other questions? Maybe I'll ask a final one. Sure. How do you go about determining these things, especially, well, mm -hmm. with companies or with countries? But I was thinking in companies yep. in particular. Do you read what everyone else reads and then looks at it, look at it in a, in a yep. certain light? Do, they, do you do interviews, investigations? Yep. It's a great question. We do not do interviews. Uh, what we look is for multiple pieces of evidence that are in the public domain that give us insight. The reason for that is um, interviews have two problems. One is when you interview someone, you are getting that one piece of data, and it may not be complete, and you tend not to get an even amount of data across all the entities. The second part is since we're measuring transparency, what you tell me in a conversation is not transparent because it's not available to everybody. So with companies, that involves reading what is available about the company. And if it's a company comment, what we're looking for are the sort of comments that their lawyers and their compliance people review. And if they commit to something or we see a behavior, their compliance people and their lawyers have signed off on it and their legal consequences if they're fraudulent about it. And we've got some proprietary techniques on how you can deduce from what is said, what is happening. At the country level, we use mostly NGO reports, and but none of the NGO reports, non-governmental organizations, if you're not familiar with that term, no one produces a report that's directly usable by us. We're looking for bits and pieces. So we know that in this chapter of this regular report that may be 2,000 pages long, there are three bits over here that are helpful to us. And, and over here in the appendix, they tend to have data that's interesting. And over the time, we've just mapped out where to get data from a variety of sources. Yes. Thank you. Thank you for the opportunity.